shaped her entire life. And today, she'll surpass John Glenn, American hero, as the oldest person to reach space at the age of 82. Oliver Damon, occupying seat number one, will be the youngest person to have traveled to space at just 18 years old. He joins us from the Netherlands. So today, we have both the youngest and the oldest people to have ever flown in space. How about that? What a crew do we have for you this morning? Each of our inaugural crew will be receiving an exclusive Omega watch as a gift, which will fly with them on their historic flight to space. And each watch will be engraved with their name, the flight number, and a unique blue origin feather on the back, something to the, remind them of today's mission for years to come. This one uh, they've donated to me for the day, but uh, sorry, Omega, you may or may not be getting it back. Sorry, not sorry, actually. Uh, now, these soon-to-be astronauts have been down here training for a couple of days now, and the great thing about New Shepard is, since it's autonomous, just about anybody can fly on board. We designed it this way from the very beginning, so the people on board can sit back and enjoy the ride of a lifetime. Let's take a look of some of that training from the last two days. This training is meant to get you comfortable with a vehicle, get comfortable and familiar with the sights and the sounds, and learn how to maintain a safe mission. Again, it's autonomous. We're not teaching you how to operate the vehicle, and that's exactly what you're seeing here. You know, I, um, I actually recently went through this training, and I gotta say, the training is a lot of fun, very informative, but also, very importantly, you really, you build these bonds with your fellow astronauts, and you create these stories together. Uh, now, my crew of astronauts, A-S-T-R-O, capital N-O-T-S, astronauts, uh, we were the fake crew. We called ourselves the prequel penguins because we were the last rehearsal crew uh, and we wouldn't be flying. But again, these are the types of stories that, that you walk away with. And uh, you know, at the end, after that training, I felt prepared to fly. And when I say prepared to fly, I felt confident in my own abilities to participate and enjoy the flight, but also confident in Blue Origin, the team, and most of all, this big, beautiful rocket that we built with safety at its core. It was a great experience and obviously one that I highly recommend, but uh, next time though, I'm not just stopping at the training, I'm getting on top of that rocket. But while we have a moment here, I want to acknowledge the entire Blue Origin team who has made first human flight possible, so many of whom are following along today at watch parties across the country. The biggest one will be at our headquarters in Kent. There they are. It is early. Good morning, guys. They're going nuts already. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Team Blue. You guys are in for an amazing day. Amazing day. I love it. I'm not really a morning person, but you know what? This is a really good excuse to get up. Let me tell you, it's gonna be a big day. All right, down here in West Texas, a little earlier today, our astronauts arrived at the Astronaut Training Center. And standing by outside the Astronaut Training Center is our on the ground correspondent, Caitlin Dietrich. Good morning, Caitlin, what is the latest? Good. Good morning, Ariane. I'm here in front of the Astronaut Training Center, and I gotta tell you, outside here, it is a beautiful day. It could not be nicer for a rocket launch. I'm looking right at the rocket on the pad here. We're all getting a little emotional and pretty excited. And at about T minus two hours down here in West Texas, the astronauts arrived here, they got out of their truck, and they walked into the training center. I There was not, uh, there was no frowns on any of their faces. Everyone was smiling. The energy was high. Wally Funk was basically skipping into the training center. Um, I think they're gonna have a good flight today. And what they're doing inside is just getting suited up with their flight suits. And they're gonna do, you know, final kind of mission briefings just to get kind of refresher here in the early morning hours. And then at T minus 45, hour, or 45 minutes when they get the go to load, they'll walk right out this door, get into this Rivian and be on their way to space. Thanks, Caitlin. I, uh, I imagine Wally Funk was more like doing cartwheels into the astronaut training center, and I highly expect her to do, be doing the same to the Rivian trucks. That woman, her energy is infectious, and she has all the reason to be excited today. As we said, she's been waiting her entire life to get to space. All right, we're going to be checking in with Caitlin a little bit later for more updates. But right now, let's turn our attention to the rocket. She's right behind me, just a couple of miles north from where I sit. Now, 
New Shepard is named after Alan Shepard, the first American to go to space in 1951. Uh, 61, that is, excuse me, 50 years ago. And earlier this morning, as you can see here, New Shepard left the barn and traveled to the launch pad to prepare to go to space and back. This time, of course, with astronauts on board, including our very first paying customer, Oliver Damon. Now, back inside the barn there, I should note that we do have a second rocket. Uh, and we have had several paying payload customers on previous flights on that rocket. We will continue to fly future payloads on that dedicated rocket for that. The rocket that's over my shoulder here, that rocket will be dedicated to flying astronauts. This flight and going forward for many more to come. This day here at Blue Origin is the culmination of years of testing, learning, and safely proving out the system across 15 successful consecutive missions. With that in mind, let's zero in on New Shepard, the importance of safety and redundancy, and how we got to first human flight. For New Shepard, we've been following an aggressive step-by-step -step approach from the beginning. The first time we flew New Shepard, we demonstrated every single aspect, re-entry, parachute deployment, and that mission was 100% successful for the capsule. M2 was about rolling in changes and trying it again. This time we stuck the landing, but we needed to show we could do it again. So that was what M3 was. For M4, we pushed the envelope, lighting the engine just seconds before it would impact the ground, and we perfected it at that time. In M5, we intentionally did not deploy one of the main parachutes, and it worked perfectly. We had done a pad escape test that the capsule can launch and escape if there is an accident on the pad. The M6 mission was about testing that at its most stressing condition. We ignited the solid rocket motor in flight and showed that we can recover the capsule safely. For M7, what we introduced was a new capsule design. M8 was just a repeat. And then the third escape test was to show that we could escape in space. So on M9, the capsule laid off its a solid rocket motor and landed safely. M9 and M13, we are flying payload missions for customers, giving us even more and more confidence in the capability of the new Shepard system. 13 was a perfect flight, preparing for the M14 mission, another verification check. We're ready for first human flight. I love hearing from our top engineers, like the architect of New Shepard, Gary Lai, who's joined me here at the desk. Gary's been at Blue Origin for over 15 years and is part of the amazing team that built New Shepard. Gary, welcome. How's it going? How's your day? It's Any, a great anything day. going on? You got anything on your schedule? Yeah, I'm a little busy. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Why don't we uh, Why don't we launch a rocket? What do you say? All right, okay. let's do it. <laughs> well, well, we got a little bit of time. Why don't we get uh, Why don't we get into some of this talk about um, about the step by step process that's gotten us to today? So we talk at Blue Origin about our motto, "Gradatum Ferociter," step by step, ferociously in Latin. Um, Talk to us about NS-14 and NS-15, the two prior uh, flights with this same rocket. What happened and why did we finally come to the conclusion it's time to put people on board? So, Ariane, the last two flights, NS-14 and NS-15, you could think of as full dress rehearsals for what we're about to do today. We used the same hardware, the same software, and even the same operational procedures as we're going to use today. Uh, really, the only difference in today's launch is that ra rather than the astronauts uh, getting out of the capsule at the last minute, um, they are gonna stay on and they're gonna enjoy the ride to space. So after those, those launches, we looked at all the data, we made sure that that hardware, that software, those procedures fulfilled all our requirements, we didn't need to change, and we came to the, the assessment that yes, we are ready. Fantastic. Now, you know, again, you've been here for now 17 years, I think it is. Uh, you've been here since the beginning of the program, the, the original blue, blueprints, the, the requirement building, all of that. Talk to me about how you guys approach safety and the safety philosophy that you took as you developed and tested and now 
are flying this rocket. So uh, we believe this, this, uh, this vehicle is very safe and is not just the record of flight test, 15 uh, consecutive successful flight test. That, uh, if it was just that, we wouldn't be able to prove it. The reason we, we know it, it's safe is because we have done so much more testing on the vehicle and the components on the ground. Um, in much more stressing conditions. Really what the flight tests tell us is what, what does the vehicle and its components have to, um, what are the normal conditions? And then on the ground, we test well beyond those conditions, really until we break it. So when we say it's safe, it's because we know it can take much more than it's gonna ever experience in flight. Really the flight is kind of easy on the vehicle. Fantastic. I want to turn our attention for just a moment to the the next vehicles in our uh, in our fleet of programs that we've got going on at Blue Origin, New Glenn and Blue Moon. New Shepard really is at the is is built into the DNA of those programs as well. We don't just stop with New Shepard. We're going orbital. We're going to the moon. We're going to beyond. Why don't you talk about how New Shepard uh, supports those other programs? So. New Shepard is just a part of the entire story of Blue Origin. Really, if you set out just to make a space tourism suborbital vehicle, you would not have built New Shepard. It would be overly complicated. We selected the architecture of New Shepard so that we could build a vehicle and technologies that would allow us to gain practice and, and develop those technologies for those other vehicles. For example, vertical powered landing. It's a very complicated way to land a vehicle, but it is very scalable. And if you are going to, to a place like the moon, you're going to have to do it. You can't land on the moon with wings. Deep throttling engines, you need that uh, to land on other planets. And then also uh, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellants. They're very high performing, the highest performing propellants they are. And you can also extract them from lunar water. So again, New Shepard, very impart, important part of everything that we're doing here at Blue Origin. Of course, we're going to have an incredible uh, suborbital tourism program. We've got a wonderful payload program with many customers who have already flown, but this is just the beginning of many great things to come at Blue Origin. Now, I want to go back a little bit and talk about, uh, we were talking about safety just a second ago. Um, talk about redundancy backup systems, and uh, in the case of New Shepard, backup systems to the backup systems to the backup systems to the backup systems. What, what is going on there? Because it's, it, it's, it goes beyond what meets the eye, right? Absolutely. So um, every system on the New Shepard vehicle that is needed for safety has one or more backups, many backups in, in a lot of cases. So let me give you some examples. So we've already talked a lot about the escape system. and, and and that will activate, if in case there's something wrong with the rocket, it will activate and propel the, the crew away uh, and land safely. We've talked about the parachutes. There are three parachutes. We have designed the vehicle to land if only one of those parachutes opens. But that is just a start. Um, every valve on the vehicle, every mechanism, every battery, every sensor, every wire, every flight computer, everything on the vehicle has a backup, and in some cases, multiple backups. An and incredibly redundant vehicle. Last question for you. Would you put your kids on board? We set out to design this vehicle for anybody, not professional astronauts, anybody with very little training. Um, and that is a very hard problem. And yes, we have succeeded, and I would put my own kids on that vehicle. All right. One day, summer vacation in space. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Appreciate the insights. I look forward to seeing you back here later on in the show, and we'll get a lot more input from uh, Gary Lai and the architect of New Shepard. And with that, let's take a breather. Check out New Shepard on the pad as we take closer to first human flight. All right, everybody, if you're just joining us, this is Blue Origin's first human flight. We're down here in West Texas coming to you live. We are T-minus one hour and 10 minutes to go until Jeff Bezos, Mark Bezos, Wally Funk, 
and our first customer from the Netherlands, Oliver Damon, rocket to space and back. The excitement is palpable down here at Launch Site 1 in West Texas. Uh, but I want to keep things moving for you, so why don't we take a closer look at the aforementioned astronauts, the Bezos brothers, Jeff and Mark. If you see the Earth from space, it changes you. It changes your relationship with this planet, with humanity. It's one Earth. I want to go on this flight because it's a thing I've wanted to do all my life. It's an adventure. It's a big deal for me. I invited my brother to come on this first flight because we're closest friends. I really want you to come with me. Would you? Are you serious? I am. I think it would be meaningful. I have my brother there. I wasn't even expecting him to say that he was going to be on the first flight. And then when he asked me to go along, I was just awestruck. You, Seriously? If you're willing, if you want oh to. God. Yeah. What a remarkable opportunity, not only to have this adventure, but to be able to do it with uh, my best friend. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What a cool story. Brothers sharing this historic experience together. Now, Mark has been part of the Blue Origin story from the very beginning. He's been with us every step of the way, and we're so excited to see him on this first human flight. You're taking a lot of us up there with you, Mark. But we're not stopping there. Second human flight and beyond are already in the works. And you know, since the auction on June 12th, uh, I've had the good pleasure of speaking on the phone with many of the participants from the auction who now have been fi quickly filling up seats for the next several launches. Sales are open, everybody. If you're interested, send us an email at astronauts at blueorigin.com. And we're planning two more flights this year, and as we said, many more to come in the years following. Folks, this is an authentic rocket ride. You're in the crew capsule, launching 100 kilometers up over the Kármán line, the internationally recognized line of space, and safely back to Earth. And what a crew capsule it is. Let's take a look. For your once-in-a-lifetime journey, you will travel past the boundaries of Earth's atmosphere and into outer space. Featuring windows that comprise one-third of the capsule's surface structure, the largest windows ever in space, you'll have a view of the curve of the planet and the vast darkness of the cosmos. Every detail of the capsule has been precision engineered for your safety and comfort, with reclining seats specifically designed to absorb the impact of landing and an escape motor that can safely propel the capsule from the booster rocket. At the apex of your flight, you'll experience weightlessness. Unbuckling from your seat, you're free to explore different perspectives from each window before your return to Earth begins. This is the beginning of a revolution in space travel, and Blue Origin is going to take you there. So yeah, our crew capsule is pretty sweet, very spacious. I should note that uh, that crew capsule has 10 times the volume that Alan Shepard had on his flight to space. And of course, you notice those big, beautiful windows in comparison to, uh, to poor Alan, who just had essentially a little porthole to look out of. Our astronauts today are going to get an amazing view. You know, today, as we mentioned, is just the first of many flights to come on New Shepard for that capsule. And let me tell you, as somebody who is at the recent live auction for the very first seat on today's rocket, people want to fly to space. We had nearly 7,600 people from 159 countries register to bid, huge global interest. And uh, it was just incredible to be in the room when the winning bid was called at $28 million. All that money went to Blue Origin's Club for the Future. It was, it was truly a stunning day for which we are extremely grateful and extremely humbled. Now, for those of you that are less familiar with our Club for the Future, you might ask, what is Club? Club for the Future's mission is to inspire younger generations to pursue career in STEM and to help invent the future of life in space. The Club and its collaborators are doing this in many ways, like sending student postcards to space on New Shepard and back, sending them, posted them, flown in space, of course. They've also been establishing face, space uh, focused curricula 
and providing access to space on Blue Origins rockets. And just last week, Blue Origins decided to spread the love. Blue Origin and Club for the Future announced that these 19 nonprofit organizations you see on your screen here will each receive $1 million from the $28 million. Incredible to see all of that money being used to help get the next generation excited about space. Why don't we take a, look, a closer look at Club for the Future, what it is, what it's doing, and where it's going. It's my generation's job to build the road to space so that the future generations can unleash their creativity. And one of the things that we have to do is inspire young people to build the future of life in space. We're from Blue Origin. We are going to be sending some postcards to space. The Club for the Future Ask K-12 students to send us postcards with their dreams of the future. Mine says the future is only a tomorrow away because if we build the future, we have to do it a day at a time. That's really poetic. That's really cool. We're going to send those postcards to space in New Shepard. And then we're going to bring them back and mail them back to you. Let's take a look at some of these. These are fantastic. What a great drawing. It's time to verify. Nice. That's beautiful. Um, I'm interested in space medicine and space exploration, so I have a futuristic city with a rocket launching. Thanks for being members of the Club for the Future. The kids I talked to earlier, if they are representative of the current generation, we are in good shape. Big things start small. Let me tell you, the future of space is in very good hands. Guys, we're building the road to space, but the journey on it is going to be yours. And there are a lot of brilliant kids out there, so please keep up the great work, guys. With that, why don't we take a breather, check out New Shepard on the pad as she gets ready for first human flight. All right, thank you again, everybody, for joining us live from West Texas. We're here at just one hour and two minutes to go until launch. We are quickly approaching our first live glimpse of today's astronauts. They're going through their final preparations with crew member seven before exiting the training center and heading out to the launch pad in their Rivian trucks. And now, crew member seven is a role that gets its name from the New Shepard program. Uh, though today's flight features four astronauts, future flights will take use of all six seats in the crew capsule. And crew member seven is just that, the seventh member of each astronaut crew. Now, it's a two-person role, and here's some footage, in fact, of Kevin Sprogue and Sarah Knights, our current crew member sevens. We'll have that for you in a second here. So Sarah and Kevin don't go to space themselves but they're critical team members that stay with the crew every step of the way, including as voice of mission control to the astronauts during the flight. So it's basically like they're in the capsule with our crew. And you're gonna hear on today's flight, Sarah as Capcom or capsule communicator. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've gone through astronaut experience training and I can tell you the crew member seven roles are essential. Kevin and Sarah met me as well as the rest of the crew that I had during training the evening that we arrived in El Paso, Texas, and were, uh, we were in great hands, in their incredibly competent hands from the beginning to the end of our journey down here in Texas. So a special thank you to Kevin and Sarah for holding it all together for our astronauts. Now I want to introduce you to another critical member of our Team Blue, Audrey Powers. In her new role as the Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations, she recently joined us here at the desk for a chat about what it's like to arrive at this very special moment. Audrey, uh, it's so great to have you here. You've been so important to the development of the, the company and this rocket, and I can only imagine, how, how are you feeling today? 
I'm feeling very, very excited. Yeah. Uh, we had an amazing flight readiness review yesterday, and the team is just so, so pumped. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so uh, we, this is not the first time our viewers have met you on the last flight. You were one of our, what we call astronauts, yep. spelled A S T R O N O T S. Yep. Um, what was that experience like going through the training and being one of the astronauts? Well, I, I was actually there working. I was not just having fun. Right, right, going, right. No, we know I this. was going through the, <laughs> the training um, to really see how it had progressed over time. A number of us did a review of the training uh, early on. And I'll say that, that our training has, has reached such a really great spot for the astronauts. Um, our human factors team has provided a lot of input. Our, our CM7 team has spent so much time really focusing on what is important for them to first safely get through the experience and then just really enjoy their time up there. Um, yeah, so it was just, it was vetting the entire uh, experience and making sure that we cover the right aspects of it. Right. So um, uh, I, I also got to be an astronaut, um, but I didn't get to do the, uh, the next kind of critical step, which is getting inside of the capsule on top of the rocket right. when it's fully fueled, fully loaded, like we did during our last, uh, our last launch and last mm -hmm. webcast. You were one of two, you and Gary Lai went in there. What was that like when you went in there and the hatch was closed? What is that feeling like? Yeah, the, the entire tower operation of astronaut load was just a very sensory experience. And we, we walk through the sequence a couple days in advance just to rehearse everything, all of the movements. But on launch day, we got out of the cars and we're standing at the bottom of the tower and you could hear the vehicle venting. And when you looked at it, there was, there was frost coming off the right. side like you see sometimes in, in movies. And it's just this overwhelming sense of this thing that is waiting to launch and we're kind of holding it up, you know? Right. So there was a, there was a great sense of urgency that didn't exist on the days that we, that we rehearsed it. And when we got up and finally ingressed and strapped into our seat, there were a lot of things. It was, it was very mechanical because of the training that we had gone through in the simulator. And we sat down and strapped in, and it wasn't until then that you're waiting for the crew to do the checks and empty out the, the cabin of the various equipment that you kind of look out and you realize, like, how high up you are. Where and, you are. <laughs> yeah, and, and you could feel the vehicle swaying a little bit on, yeah. the, on the launch mount. Like, that, that rocket is ready to launch. Um, and when it closed, I remember thinking before, like, oh, I'm going to have all these clever things to say to Gary, you know, because we've worked together for so long. And, like, I couldn't think of anything. It was just like, I want to go so bad, <laughs> you know? Like, can you, can you lock the hatch from the inside? Um, we, were, just, we were wondering if you guys were going to do a little stowaway situation. Sorry, there are cameras. I know. Yep. Yeah. So it was, it was just this, this really rich sensory experience being in there from all angles. Yeah. Well, so... Uh, you are now head of New Shepard uh, Flight Admission Ops. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like this day that we're actually putting people on board and we're closing the hatch and we're keeping the people in the castle to go to space and back? What does that feel like? Well, um, we, we've spent, in recent weeks, we've finalized a years-long effort called our Human Flight Certification Plan. And it culminated in an extensive review, um, a, you know, la over the last month, with external reviewers um, and our FAA partners were involved, and it, it's kind of it was the culmination of the entire program, you know, years of work on this program, and I was so struck by how much work has gone into this right. across the years and across the disciplines. And the, the people in that room kind of finalizing all of these check boxes, it was, it was just an overwhelming sense of the history that we had collected of this program. Um, and I was so, I, 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 before I, I came to this position in New Shepard, um, I supported New Shepard. Um, and I, I knew the hard work that was going on in this program, but I have been so, so struck by just the professionalism and the bias for action and just the critical thinking that everyone on this program puts in. And I, I, I have been awestruck by people that I have been working with for years. I mean, I knew, I knew what great work they did, but, but being part of it and part of this team, I'm, just, I'm so honored that they 
um, you know, wanted me in this position and, and that I'm participating in this now. Yeah. Well, Audrey, to you and to your team, to the whole Blue Origin team, thank you for all of your hard work. We cannot wait to see the launch and, um, you know, Godspeed New Shepard. Thank you. I can't wait to see it either. <laughs> Audrey offers such great insight into New Shepard. She's also a pilot herself. Oh, and the chair of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. She's had an incredible impact on space legislation and policy in some major ways, as well as a major impact on Blue Origin. So thank you to Audrey. She's kind of busy today. So we're, uh, we're very proud to have had her on stage just a couple of days ago. All right, we're at T minus 55 minutes to go until launch. Let's go ahead and check out New Shepard as she gets ready for her flight today to space and back with our first human flight crew. Thank you everybody again for joining us live from West Texas for Blue Origin's first human flight. We are at T minus 52 minutes to go until launch. Right now our four astronauts are inside the astronaut training center. We are waiting for them to exit to get in the Rivians and then we will be waiting for a go for astronaut load in. Uh, I can already hear the helicopter above that's going to be uh, following them on their way out. Now, that astronaut training center, uh, what we have in that training center is basically it's a classroom, but I'd say the centerpiece of it um, is a, a beautiful crew capsule simulator. And it's a really cool simulator. Some of you have, may have seen in the past, we've had a, a, a mock-up that we've been able to take to various events. But the simulator that's in the astronaut uh, training center is kind of a, a step above, a step beyond, because in it, we are able to simulate the sounds, the vibrations, the uh, full crew screen and alert system that we have uh, for every single seat. And so during the training, you spend a lot of time, of course, understanding with crew member seven, understanding the general New Shepard system, all of the procedures, ingress, egress, uh, and, and getting to know the, the Blue Origin team. But you do spend a lot of time in that crew capsule. And as mentioned, we, we go through these simulations of the flights and of all sorts of different scenarios so that our astronauts feel comfortable, as we said, so they can sit back and kind of enjoy the ride, enjoy this incredible experience. They've got these huge windows right next to them. We want them to be focused on that view, focused on feeling the Gs as they come on. You know, you're in these beautiful, nice, soft, uh, uh, reclined seats that disperse the Gs. It's a wonderful experience. And that simulator, we run these scenarios, we've got full audio, we've got full vibration, 
and it's it's a uh, it's a really critical component of the the training program let's say now uh, we also of course we will take them out to the pad the day before launch we want them to walk up the uh, the crew access tower uh, you'll see uh, it's hidden a little bit in that shot there on the left there but that is the safety shelter so we'll see as the astronauts drive out to the pad itself they will ascend the stairs the set of stairs on the left they'll take kind of a bit of a, a timeout in the safety shelter the crew member seven kevin spro will go out to the across across the bridge there to the uh to the tower that's in the center of your screen he will be working with the tower crew there make sure everything is set and sorted to go for our astronauts he will then go back to the uh to the safety shelter and get the uh the astronauts and get them ingressed into the capsule. The astronauts right now, though, they are in the astronaut training center. Again, we are waiting for them to emerge shortly here. We are T minus 49 minutes to go until launch. Again, they are going to be uh, entering into the, the Rivian trucks and heading out to the uh, out to the training, excuse me, out to the, uh, the launch pad. This will be our first glimpse of the astronauts. We're going to see those shining smiles of them, of theirs. I'm sure they're trying to contain their excitement. You know, you've got that that excited energy that, of course, they're, they, they are controlling themselves. Although, again, let's be honest. Wally Funk doesn't control her her excitement. I'm as I said fully expecting her to do uh, uh, full full uh, somersaults and uh, and cartwheels on her way into the Rivians and why don't we just wait here for a moment as we wait for those astronauts to emerge. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live for New Shepard's first human flight. We are waiting for our astronauts to emerge from the astronaut training center. We've got the uh, we've got our on the ground correspondent, Caitlin Dietrich, who is just outside of the training center. Caitlin, what's going on out there? So you can really feel the energy start to build now. We just heard that everything's continuing nominally towards launch. The countdown is is moving forward. We've got our helicopters in the air waiting to capture our astronauts as they take their Rivians to the launch pad. The sun's coming up. It's a beautiful morning. Our teams are going to be standing on the road hooting and hollering as the astronauts drive by on their way to the tower. And I'm starting to get goosebumps over here. and It's a little bit emotional, but we'll be back in just a couple minutes and uh, we'll watch these Astros as they head out into their truck and on their way to space. Fantastic. Thanks, Caitlin. We'll uh, send it back to Caitlin in a moment here as we wait for those astronauts to emerge from the astronaut training center. You know, I'll tell you, the last thing that they do before they exit the training center is there's this special uh, coin ceremony. It's a challenge coin that's given to each one of the astronauts for them to take in their suit up to space and back. It's a, it's a military tradition, but what's it really makes you feel like you are part of a team um, and what a team to be part of, what a crew to be part of. Only New Shepherds uh, astronauts are gonna be able to get these coins. You only, get to, you only get the coin if you get to go up to space and back. And these astronauts, again, have completed their, their training and they are ready to become the next set of international astronauts. So again, we're waiting here for just a moment while we wait for the astronauts to emerge from the astronaut training center, we are at T minus 46 minutes to go until launch.
Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live for New Shepard's first human flight. We are at T-minus 45 minutes, and here the astronauts come. There you see Jeff Bezos in the foreground, Oliver Damon stepping into the Rivian. Crew member seven, Kevin Sprogue, there on the right. As well as Wally Funk. What a moment for her. At the age of 82, she will become the oldest astronaut to have ever flown into space. <laughs> There she is, loading into the Rivian. Wally was part of the Mercury 13 program back in the 1960s. The program to train women to go to space that ultimately was canceled, but now it is her moment. Today is an incredible day for her. All right, now we're going to be waiting for mission control to get a, a go for astronaut load out to the pad. That's when they will, the Rivian will start heading out towards the pad. They're actually gonna pass right behind me here. I'm certainly gonna give them a wave. They then will pass mission control, get some last minute love from, uh, from our team there as well as their families. And then they will head down the road to space to the launch pad. And we're go for load in. There they go, everybody. <laughs> what a moment. You can probably hear our team already losing it down here. We are super excited. And there they are. 
high fives from everybody. What an incredible moment. They're coming over here just behind my right shoulder. A moment we've been waiting for here at Blue Origin. So much hard work has led to this moment. How exciting. Wally Funk, the Bezos brothers, Oliver Damon, our four crew members are heading out to the launch pad. There they go, see you guys. Oh my gosh, they are in for the flight of a lifetime. And just a couple yards to my left here, that is Mission Control, and here they go, passing by Mission Control. There you see Jeff Bezos waving to the team. And they're gonna hang a left there as they head down the road to space. Now, while we watch them travel down that road to space, they've got just a couple of moments. It's a long two mile road there. We've got a couple of moments. Why don't we meet aviation icon, Wally Funk? You're in zero gravity for four minutes. You come back down. We land gently on the desert surface. We open the hatch and you step outside. What's the first thing you say? I will say, honey, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I'll give you <laughs> I've been flying forever and I have 19,600 flying hours. I have taught over 3,000 people to fly, private, commercial, instrument, flight engineer, airline transport, gliding, everything that the FAA has, I've got the license for. And I can outrun you. <laughs> Back in the 60s, I was in the Mercury 13 program. They asked me, do you want to be an astronaut? I said, yes. They told me that I had done better and completed the work faster than any of the guys. So I got a hold of NASA four times I said, I want to become an astronaut, but nobody would take me. I didn't think that I would ever get to go up. Nothing has ever gotten in my way. And they said, Wally, you're a girl. You can't do that. I said, guess what? Doesn't matter what you are. You can still do it if you want to do it. And I like to do things that nobody has ever done. We're going to fly you up into space on the very first flight. That's your... your... <laughs> I can't tell people that are watching how fabulous I feel to have been picked by Blue Origin to go on this trip. You're gonna be an astronaut. Oh, finally! And I'll love every second of it. Woo! Ha <laughs> ha, I can hardly wait. We are just so thrilled and frankly honored to help Wally Funk finally realize her dream of going to space. Now, recently, I was lucky enough to spend a couple of moments with her right here at the desk. Why don't we take a look? Wally, it is a pleasure to meet you. Um, as, a, as a fellow pilot, you are an inspiration, so thank you. You don't know how great it is to meet you, that you are a pilot, and I want you to go fly more in that glider and in and jumping. Oh, that's, well, that's great. And hopefully follow in your footsteps and go on New Shepard one day. Absolutely. Oh, I mean, yes. So, Wally, you've you've waited a while to go to space. Um, a silly question, but are you excited? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, since, since I got on the airplane and I got to fly the airplane <clears throat> and get here and meet all of you, this is so fantastic. What do you, on, so on launch day, what do you think is going to be the most exciting thing? What are you looking forward to the most? Lift off, <laughs> climb, undo, and be able to move around in the, if, if there's room, I want to do a lot of stuff because I've done that in, in other situations. And you were just telling me a second ago, you're going to take your camera up there and you've got a postcard that you're going to take a photo with. Is that, that is what's going to be on the window when I go up, and then I'm going to take a picture of it with the Earth behind me. That's such a beautiful photo of you and the American flag back there in your <laughs> flight suit, and um, that's going to be a spectacular photo. So 
you know, this is probably, I imagine, your first time down here in West Texas at oh, our launch site. absolutely. What do you think? No, I, I used to be in Texas and, and teach. I, I think everything is fantastic. I mean, I've been treated so well, and the food is so great. I can't believe it's coming from, uh, I don't know, California. Right, right. And, and you're lucky to be here with all these friends and the people and, and, and see what's going on. Absolutely. Well, so, Wally, as I said, you've been an inspiration to me. Uh, what would you say to the next generation of, of, of young people that are out there that want to go to space? Well, I've talked to young people all my life. How many of you girls and boys want to fly? Well, not many raise their hands. I said, well, I tell you what, get your parents to take you out and give you a flight. Right. That's what I, my parents did at seven years old. And if you like it, you'll continue on. And if you don't, you might continue on because something's going to be in your heart that's going to want you to do that. I cannot wait to see you go to space. Thank you for being with us. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, honey. So yes, as you just saw, Wally Funk is the real deal. I was doing my best to contain my fangirl moment there because she, again, is an inspiration to so many people around the world and myself included. We see here that the astronauts are starting to ascend the crew tower. There's Wally Waven. She's leading the crew. Gary, welcome back. It's good to have you back here at the desk to Thank get you, you to help with the play-by-play -play here. We just saw a moment ago uh, that they drove around the ring road, stopped, took a photo because, of course, you know, you got we were going to we're memorializing this moment as best we can for these astronauts. They so deserve it. So going up the tower, we've got Wally. Then it looks like Jeff Bezos, his brother Mark, and Oliver Damon. They're heading up to their rocket. Now, while we have a moment here, I do understand that Kaylin Dietrich is standing by at Mission Control. What's going on outside Mission Control, Caitlin? Hey guys, Caitlin here. I'm with Jarrett Jones, the head of our New Glenn program here. Uh, Jarrett, how are you feeling today watching the launch here from Mission Control? Excited, awesome. This is amazing. It's just incredible. You could only dream about this day. And you know what, Caitlin? It's not lost on me and probably many of the viewers that today is like July the 20th, the day Neil Armstrong, who also graduated from my alma mater, boiler up, uh, stepped on the moon <laughs> and uh, made history. And we're doing it at New Shepard and Blue Origin, doing our first human launch. And it's just amazing. And the reason I'm excited, but also focused, is that there's quite a bit of technology transfer from New Shepard to New Glenn. Everything from the BE-3 engine with the, uh, the locks and and the hydrogen all the way down to our landing gear. I mean, this is an exciting day for us, and I'm just excited. I don't want to take the uh, spotlight away. It's about New Shepard, and uh, I'm just very proud of this team, and then Blue Origin as a whole. I mean, just amazing, just amazing day, Caitlin. Well, we like to say that New Shepard is basically the second stage of New Glenn, so you're kind of seeing the second stage fly here today. Absolutely, absolutely. New Shepard was built and designed for scalability, and we took advantage of it in New Glenn. So it's amazing, amazing feat that we're doing, and just proud to be here. Just glad to be here, Caitlin. So smart. It's the epitome of our step-by-step -step approach, as you hear us say. And I want to pan back to Mission Control. We've got a lot of our team here on the porch here. Hey, guys. We are so excited. We saw the astronauts fly by here just a second ago. And right in that room is some of the world's most brilliant engineers flying this rocket today. And I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a little bit emotional. Um, so back to you, Ariane, and we'll see you, we'll see you after launch. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Enjoy the launch. Jared Jones, enjoy the launch. Everybody out there uh, outside of Mission Control, as well as in Mission Control, enjoy the launch. Uh, you know, Gary, we talked about it a little bit earlier. We were, Caitlin touched on it just a second ago, how basically New Shepard is being scaled up to New Glenn. Tell me how you've thought about that, because you've, you're part of, obviously, New Shepard, the architect of New Shepard, but you've been part of thinking about the broader roadmap, if you will, that Blue Origin has. That's right. Uh, New Glenn is it is a scaled up version of New Shepard. It does use different main propulsion for the first stage, but the second stage of New Glenn, 
Uh, that engine is a derivative of the new of the BE3 engine that's flying New Shepard today. Um, and the techniques for vertical landing, which we perfected with the New Shepard vehicle, are going to be applied to the New Glenn vehicle. We have very high confidence that the very first launch of New Glenn will stick that landing on the ship. We would not have that confidence without the New Shepard program. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jarrett Jones, again, who leads that entire New Glenn program, he, uh, he has a, a, a big job, but he's gotten a lot of help. He's kind of gotten this catapulted help from the development and now the, the operations and flight of New Shepard. I should note that New Glenn will also carry humans one day. We build all of our programs from the very beginning with the intent to put people on board. And talking about astronauts in people, we just saw them enter into the uh, astronaut safety shelter. I would like to highlight one thing which is, uh, you know, uh, Wally was saying that she could she could outrun you. She was the first up those stairs <laughs> and first in the astronaut shelter. So she, no lie, that uh, that Wally Funk, she uh, she's got quite a bit of energy. You know, people, she's 82, but I'm convinced every time I read that that it's a typo <laughs> that she's actually 28 because again that woman. All right. Gary, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the shelter? Because we should remind our viewers that on the last uh, flight that we had, we basically did a full up rehearsal of what we're doing right now. You were part of that, uh, of that astronaut crew that we had. What happens in the shelter? So the shelter is, uh, has two main functions. It's a shelter in case of of some kind of emergency. If they need to evacuate the capsule very quickly, they can go, go across the bridge very only about 75 feet and be in this shelter very fast. It is fireproof. It can handle a whole set of anomalies that might happen with the rocket. Um, you see those blue tanks against the wall? The shelter has its own breathing supply, air breathing supply um, in case of a fire outside. It also has uh, communications. They can talk directly to Capcom from there. Right now, they are just um, waiting for the go-ahead from the pad crew uh, that is um, preparing the capsule to start astronaut load. Fantastic, and you see there in the foreground in the black suit, that is Kevin Sprogue, our crew member seven, as well as Wally Funk, seated on the left, soon to become the oldest person to have ever flown in space. Then, going clockwise here, Oliver Damon, soon to be the youngest person to have ever flown in space at the age of 18. He comes to us from the Netherlands. A special shout out to our inter international viewers, especially those in the Netherlands. Hello, everybody. You should be very proud of your countrymen there. Then we have, of course, Mark Bezos, brother to Jeff Bezos, our founder in the cowboy hat. He is a, uh, he's, he is a, a, a true Texan as, at heart. You know, we call it the ranch down here. We like to incorporate that into uh, into a lot of what we of what we do and the spirit that we have down here at our launch site one. All right, they are leaving the uh, astronaut safety shelter here. Let's watch as they prepare to cross the bridge. What a moment, Jeff Bezos, Mark Bezos. Wally Funk and Oliver Damon. Ring the ceremonial bell, making some noise on their way to get into the crew capsule. Kevin, the crew member seven that you see there in the black suit, he is now going to help them ingress, get into the capsule, get situated in their seats, and uh, of course help them get buckled into their harnesses and go through any final safety checks before closing the hatch. I mean, we should note though, Gary and I, again, I have both been through the, the uh, astronaut training experience. It's a five point harness. By the, by the time you're done with training, you can do that upside down, backwards with your eyes closed, uh, inside and out. I mean, you, you definitely understand how, uh, how that works and you're gonna need to because when we come back, you wanna get back into your seat from zero G, that's very important. Let's watch here as they cross the gantry, taking some final photos. We've got our photographer there, Felix Kuhns. 
a brilliant photographer who's taken those uh, those beautiful shots of the crew that we saw earlier. And there they go into the crew capsule. Gary, do you want to talk about uh, the uh, the hosing and the piping that you see going into the hatch? So that is just a cabin environmental control system. While it's on the pad, uh, before we seal the hatch, we want to make sure it's, the air is fresh and, and air conditioned in there. Um, that that hose will be removed, obviously, during hatch closure. And so what they're doing now is just one by one entering the cabin and getting getting fastened, and uh, then they will go through a series of comm checks with Capcom. Fantastic. There's Wally Funk in seat number three there. Oliver getting situated in seat number one. I'm, I'm starting to shake a little bit. I mean, <laughs> Not only, again, have we practiced this, and not only on the last flight did we have a full astronaut rehearsal like this, but it's different. We've done, again, 15 consecutive missions to get to this point. But it's so much different when you put people on board. Uh, but again, so much testing, so much design, so much thought, and incredibly well-trained Blue Origin team uh, that's supporting these these astronauts, our first crew on New Shepard. Just wonderful. We, we are ready for today. Now, we are standing by here for Capcom to welcome our crew into the capsule. Let's stand by for some audio there. There's our mission control. And Sarah Knights. Sarah Knights, again, has, she has this incredible... I have you loud and clear, Seven. How me? Here comes Seven. Kevin will help you out. Here it comes, Wally. It, it, I can see it. It's jammed in there. Don't, don't, don't keep pulling on it. Don't get it. So again, we've got Capcom Sarah Knight. She's one of our crew member seven on the left. Our four astronauts are loaded into the capsule. There is Wally Funk in her seat, as well as Mission Control. Talk about talk about locked and loaded. These, this team is really, I mean, you've been in, in Mission Control during during these launches, what is that like? So at this point in the procedure, everybody is incredibly focused. They're true professionals. They are, they are looking at the data, they're following procedures. There's really no distraction. You can hear a pin drop in that room unless they're working an issue. And as you saw in that, in that picture, we run a very, very tight ship here at Blue Origin and on the New Shepard program. That, that picture of the front room of mission control, that is all the people that are operating the rocket at this point in, in terms of pushing the buttons to make things happen in addition to the pad crew. There you see, we've got crew member seven that is uh, making sure Wally's harnesses are all tight and snug there. You know, to your point about crew, uh, Gary, I mean, we talk about designing an autonomous vehicle that launches and lands and we reuse, but we've built also the operations to also complement that, to lower the cost of accessing to space, because that's that's at the heart of, of building this road. Back windows, that's it. That is all that is needed to launch the Shepard. We have some support staff on call in uh, Washington state in case of an anomaly, but for the most part, that's it. And we architected it that way. So Look, oh, we got catch, did you say catch oh, Wally? She, yes. she was waving at you, Gary. Oh, <laughs> and is that, I think that's the, uh, that's the postcard that she promised everybody she was going to be bringing up to space with her. So not only is the crew ready, but uh, we've got the props ready. We've, we've got, we've got the photo shoot all set up. But getting back to, uh, to the, the crew and crew operations that we've set up, as you said, lean and mean, but also, we talked about it earlier, in addition to the safety and critical to safety are redundant systems, backup systems, backup to the backup. And, uh, you know, we were talking about 
um, the team that we have back in Kent. So that that is part of it. It's not just in, you know, let's say the mechanical systems, the engineering that goes into the capsule, but from an operational standpoint, we've built that in from the very beginning. Some beautiful shots there of the capsule. So the window with the uh, the white square there, that is uh, that is Wally Funk. To the left, that is uh, that is Mark Bezos, Jeff Bezos' brother. And in fact, to the left of him, a little harder to see off of that other window, uh, that will be Jeff Bezos. And Oliver Damon on the other side of the hatch. He's also uh, harnessed in, ready to go to space, ready to become the youngest person to have ever flown in space. Again, he comes from the Netherlands. So beautiful, again, as we talked about at Blue Origin, we really want to we want to open up this experience to the world, and it's so wonderful um, that he is not just representing the next generation, but also more flags as we fly to space. Standing by here from Capcom. New Shepard, this is Blue Origin Mission Control. Good morning, astronauts, and welcome aboard the RSS First Step. Let's get things started with a comm check. Astronaut Oliver, how do you read? Astronaut Oliver, how do you read? Blue Control, astronaut Oliver, loud and clear. Copy. Astronaut Wally, how do you read me? Wally, uh, push the button and answer. What? Actually, push the button and tell you can you're good. Oh, boy, that's clear. <laughs> Copy, Astronaut Wally. Astronaut Demo. Blue Control, this is Astronaut Demo. I have you loud and clear. Copy. Astronaut Bezos. I read you loud and clear. Thanks for everything, Sarah. We appreciate it. It's my honor and my pleasure. All right, astronauts, we are at T minus 21 minutes and counting. As we proceed, I'll keep you updated. For now, just sit back and relax. Fantastic. And there you heard it. All four astronauts are ready to go to space. They just had a quick comms check with Sarah Knights on Capcom, one of our crew member seven there. Uh, you heard all four astronauts are, are jazz. You know, Wally there was, I, I'm sure she's a bit distracted again. We've said this before. She has waited over 60 years from the days that she was part of the Mercury 13 program to go to space. That program to get women into space was canceled. But you know what? She is uh, canceled no more, everybody. She is going to space. Such an honor to be able to help her realize this dream of going to space after so long. What I mean, what a what a what a moment, what a woman that uh, that really personifies perseverance and, and, and pushing through it. All right. And here we go. We are closing the hatch. Gary, do you want to talk a little about what happens when you close the hatch? Obviously, it's a pressurized vehicle. What, what does that mean with regards to, uh, to closing the hatch there? So the hatch has a double seal on it. There are two sets of seals. So what they're going to do when they close the hatch to make sure it is properly sealed is they're actually going to pull a vacuum in between both of those seals and make sure that vacuum doesn't decay. Um, and that checks the integrity of both seals. Fantastic. Now, I understand that we've got Caitlin Dietrich again on the ground. We've got an update from her. Caitlin, what's going on? She is, uh, she is just, she's almost ready. So let's, let's hold off on just a moment for our update from, uh, from Caitlin Dietrich. In the meantime, let's watch here as the, uh, the tower crew continues to uh, close close the hatch, make sure that the, the pressure seals are all, uh, all ready to go. There we see Mark Bezos giving the thumbs up. There's Jeff in the background waving. What, a, what an experience to do with, with your, your siblings, your, your best friend. What, what, an, what a day for this four crew. Gary, you, uh, you know, we mentioned again that you have gone through the astronaut experience. You, uh, you went through it. Uh, actually, here we go. I think we've got Caitlin. Just a moment, Gary. Hold that thought. Caitlin, what's going on out there at Mission Control? 
Hey everyone. So basically we've actually left mission control, the porch, and now we're at what we call fallback three. It's on basically the entrance to the road to space. And right here is where the astronauts drove by. They went all the way to the tower. You can probably see it there in the very distance. Here we just closed the hatch and everything's looking nominal. And basically what's gonna happen is once the parachute, or excuse me, once the capsule is under parachutes, we have a convoy here right behind us that's gonna be racing out to get that hatch open and celebrate after their victorious flight to space. So that's what we're all preparing for here after their 11 minute flight. So we're pretty excited. Wonderful, thank you so much, Caitlin, for that update. Gary, uh, so you, as we were just closing out that question, so on the last one, you actually were in the capsule, right? You and Audrey Powers, who we talked to a little bit earlier in the show, were in the capsule when they closed the hatch. What does it feel like at this moment? It's actually quite tranquil. Uh, after the excitement and all the helicopters and, and, and ingressing and, and that adrenaline, you have a moment in the capsule now to reflect when, when the hatch is closed. It's actually pretty quiet. You've got ear pro hearing protection in just in case. You can still hear um, Capcom, but you have a moment to reflect. The fact that you are seated, reclined in a seat next to a window, directly next to a window that is so big, you can just turn your head and feel like you're floating right on the edge of the rocket. And then we've, we've designed it that way so that when you are actually in space, you don't have to turn your head, you, you right. can look right out and have the sensation of actually being out. And it also kind of adds to the voluminous feel of the, the capsule. We said earlier it's 10 times the volume that Alan Shepard had on his flight, but but it's, it is big, and the windows make it look big, that light acoustic padding make it look big, and then once you're floating up there in, in space over the Kármán line in zero G, it kind of adds a third dimension to it. Yes, we wanted that spaciousness, we wanted that sensation of floating. Really, if we were able to do it, we would have made the entire capsule transparent. <laughs> that, that, that is kind of a, a cool idea. Is that for the next iteration? You working on that? Is that in secret? <laughs> All right, we're, we're not gonna release those information on our webcast, but stay tuned, everybody. All right, we're gonna toss it back to Capcom. I understand that we've got a special message from uh, Christina Bezos, sister to Jeff, and Mark Bezos. First step, blue control. On that note, Jeff and Mark, I have a special message from you for your, from your sister Christina. Steve and I are so excited for this monumental launch. Jeff, this is something you've dreamed of your whole life, and your passion for space is infectious. Mark, you're the best champion when it comes to encouraging us in our adventures. As you buckle in, I'm reminded of when Jeff was Captain Kirk, Mark, you were Sulu, and I took the role of Lieutenant Uhura. We would battle Klingons while firing torpedoes, all the while dodging in and out of traffic and praying that we make it to our destination safely. Mark, be prepared to fire those torpedoes if ordered to do so. Now hurry up and get your asses back down here so I can give you a huge hug. We love you. And Godspeed, New Shepherd. And there it is. Beautiful message from Christina. There is our Kent headquarters going nuts as they should. A big day for our full Blue Origin team. It's early out there on the West Coast, but they wouldn't miss it for the world. Look at them. So amazing. Again, what a day for the entire Blue Origin team, for these crew members that are on board, for their families that are here, that have been supporting each one of these people's dreams to go to space. Just incredible. And, uh, you know, we are sitting here at T-minus 15 minutes to go until launch. We are in a brief hold here. But why don't we meet Oliver Dayton, one of those astronauts, again, our first, very, very first paying customer and soon to be the youngest person to travel to space at 18. Let's see Dal Oliver. I think it's the ultimate dream for so many people to go to space. I guess my first memories of space 
were Thunderbirds. <laughs> I was a big fan of that. Watched every single episode there was. That was like the big thing with like the rockets and everything. Oliver, is this your first look at the vehicle? Yeah. It's so cool to go with this group because Wally is like one of the best pilots ever and has such an amazing life story. Of course, Jeff is one of the best businessmen ever and a great visionary. And Mark is a firefighter and has such an amazing track record over his life. I feel a uh, responsibility because I'm the youngest in space and to get more people interested in space and not even just space but science would be such an opportunity for me to do. When I touch down and I get out of the vehicle, I think I'll be just speechless. Now, Oliver also has his pilot's license and will be studying physics in college and in just a bit he'll officially be an astronaut, but uh, Gary, do you, did you talk to Oliver? I did, I had an opportunity to meet him. Uh, did you start recruiting? <laughs> did, you, did you get on that? What are you doing sitting here? Oh, come on, man. We were like, that, that guy, not only is he gonna study physics, but also innovation. So we can, only, we can only imagine what is in store for Oliver in the years to come. But I can tell you what's, what is in store for him in the next couple of minutes here. He is going to go to space over the Kármán line, up 100 kilometers up the internationally recognized line of space, and he is going to come back a freshly minted astronaut. Cannot wait for that. Now, we are at T-minus 15 minutes to go until launch. We are in a brief hold here. And while we're in a hold, why don't we turn it over to New Shepard and watch the rocket as she gets ready to take these four astronauts to space and back. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live from West Texas. We are here at T minus 15 minutes to go until launch. We are in a brief hold. Uh, we've got our astronauts that are loaded into the capsule. You saw there just a moment ago, we had Oliver Damon on the left, in the left window. To the right of the hatch is our founder, Jeff Bezos, coming around. Around him is uh, Mark Bezos, and on the opposite side of the capsule is Wally Funk. And again, we're just here in a, a brief hold, but while we have a moment, let's throw it back to the pad and catch out some of those shots of our astronauts as they get ready for their flight to space and back this morning.
Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live from West Texas for New Shepard's first human flight. We are at T minus 15 minutes. We are in a brief hold here. This is okay. I mean, to say, Gary, you can appreciate this. We spend, we spent years designing this rocket, months and months designing the mission. And if we need to take a couple of minutes more to make sure that the team is aligned, that we're all set and sorted, that our astronauts are happy, that the weather both on the ground and up aloft is within green zones, then we're going to do that. How do you guys think about holds when you're in mission control? What is happening right now? There's really two kinds of holds. There might be a hold while they investigate an anomaly. And very often that is not the case though. Um, there are sometimes holds just to catch up in the timeline. The thing about New Shepard, that's distinct that from several from orbital vehicles that you might have seen is that we don't need to launch at a precise time to meet some some launch window because we're trying to intercept something in space. We have a lot of time. We can take our time. It's, it's better to pause and, and hold if there's any reason to, if, if there's a sensor reading that you want to investigate or you just want to catch up in time. So that's why we tend to take these holds. Otherwise, we, we bias to launching as soon as possible so we don't otherwise have a lot of buffer in, in the normal count. Absolutely. So again, the, uh, well, actually, now I understand the hold is lifted. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, that we have gotten the timelines all aligned, our teams are all sorted, and we are continuing our countdown. While we have a moment here, again, let's throw it back to the pad, check out our astronauts in the capsule as they get ready for their launch to space and back this morning. All right, everybody, we are at T minus 14 minutes and five seconds to go until launch here. Can, got goosebumps going already. The, the, again, the adrenaline is building and the energy is building up here as the clock ticked down. And uh, while our astronauts and our teams are going through the final checks with our crew member seven and the launch team, let's talk about seeing uh, Earth from space and how it changes you. And uh, we're very fortunate here at Blue Origin to have several NASA astronauts that are working with us. And they've logged hundreds of hours in space and they offer a keen perspective on what our first human flight astronauts are just minutes away from experiencing. I find it's very interesting that people can look at a picture of Earth taken by an astronaut, but they don't get that change inside that actually being there in space gives you. It is one of those things that you, you kind of have to do. The perspective from space is a really fantastic one. You, you can see things that you never thought you'd see from Earth. It really can't help but change your life. It changes your perspective. Having that kind of an experience makes you feel smaller. You really do come back with a sense that the Earth is a closed environment. Everything we have here to eat, breathe, drink, it's all traveling together and looking at the blackness of space and looking at the surface of the Earth and seeing that almost nothing separates those two. All of humankind is on this one small rock, protected by this thin, fragile little layer of air. It makes you realize that the planet is, in fact, a giant spaceship traveling through space that's home to seven billion of us. And I think every astronaut who goes to space is changed by it in some way. They've actually documented a change in core values in almost all astronauts from before the flight to after the flight. And as millions and millions of people begin to get this experience, I think the knowledge on Earth and a different understanding about our planet will gradually occur. The experience of something that, that changes who you are on the inside, it's very powerful. It is so memorable and so unique that, that people walk away speechless. Incredible stuff. I, I hope one day I get to experiencing experience that. And I know obviously the four people that are on top of that rocket are about to do that. 
Gary, do you want to talk to us a little bit about today's uh, flight profile, how they're getting up to space over the Carmen line and back home down here to West Texas? Absolutely. So T minus zero is the, the time that we... Actually, Gary, if you don't mind standing by, I understand that we are uh, ready for our go, no-go poll. This is the flight director. New Shepard is go for launch. Booster, commence similar count. We'll go flight. Controllers, drop UHF voice. Enabling onboard power. All right, thank you everybody for joining us again. Uh, sorry about that. So we were we got so caught up in uh, in the flight profile and in that uh, and the, the perspectives from our NASA astronauts. We just caught the tail end there of the go no go poll, um, but I'm hearing that we're uh, we're looking good for flight today. So let's get back into that flight profile, Gary, that you're telling us about here. Again, how are they getting up to space over the Kármán line, the internationally recognized line of space, and then back down here? Uh, to Earth in West Texas. Okay, so T minus zero is actually not the point of liftoff. It's when we um, send the command to start the engine. It lifts off about seven seconds later. It will ascend um, for about two and a half minutes um, and, and then shut off. Its, we, it goes through what we call MECO, main engine cutoff. About 20 seconds after that, the capsule will separate, and that's when the fastened seatbelt uh, light uh, on their panels will, will turn off, and they'll be able to float around the capsule for three to four minutes. Um, during that time, um, the, the both vehicles are still ascending, and they will ascend above 100 kilometers to Carmen Line. Today, we're, we're headed for about 105, 106 kilometers, um, and, and then start de their descent. Um, the capsule, the, the booster will actually uh, re-enter first. It's, it's more aerodynamic. Um, before it hits the, the atmosphere, it deploys wedge fins on top to stabilize it um, and then uses those aft fins um, to steer back uh, over the pad. Um, just over the pad, about 20,000 feet above, it deploys drag brakes to slow itself down and then restarts its engines just seconds before hitting the ground to slow itself down to a soft landing. The la landing legs will come out just seconds before landing. It might do one or two uh, maneuvers to make sure that it's over that pad um, and then it will touch down softly. Meanwhile, the capsule will, will continue its flight. Um, the astronauts will strap back in before um, hitting the atmosphere, get back in their seats. There'll be thrusters that will stabilize the, the capsule just to prevent it from rocking too much, and then parachutes will deploy about 10,000 feet above the ground. First, drogues will fire, and those will extract the mains. And then finally, a landing will occur on a cushion of air, uh, which will fire um, just about six feet off the ground Fantastic, and, and you know we've mentioned this before on previous webcasts that uh, the uh, the dirt down here it's like talcum powder. It goes everywhere, and so when we have that air cushion that fires, it really kicks up the dust. But again, they're coming in at just about one or two miles an hour. It's a really nice soft landing. And uh, again, Gary, we confirmed we are go for launch for first human flight on New Shepard. Oh my goodness, I mean, I, you've been waiting for this day for. 17 years since you joined Blue Origin. What what are you feeling right now, Gary? It's still hard to believe that it's actually here. I don't know if it's set in yet, but the main thing I'm feeling is I'm thinking about uh, the entire team, past and present, the hundreds and hundreds of people um, that have worked on the New Chef program and what this must mean to them. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, we talked about about the, the team here, we, we, it's, a, it's a lean and mean team, obviously, but each one of those people has contributed so much to this program. It's, uh, again, a special shout out to all of our, our Blue Origin team members watching around the world. Now, uh, for the others that are watching around the world, uh, if you want to experience space flight for yourself, if you want to do what Jeff and Mark and Wally and Oliver are doing today, and you're serious about it, send us an email at astronauts at blueorigin.com. We are open 
We're open for ticket sales to send you all to space. What just an incredible, incredible day. And, uh, you know, it, we, we, the, we ha we're so lucky to have this particular crew on board today, Gary. And I feel like, um, you know, not only do we have this beautiful story about uh, the, the Bezos brothers that are going up and Wally and, and Oliver, soon to be the oldest and the, uh, the youngest astronauts who have ever flown in space. Oliver, that's representing our international uh, friends out there taking the, uh, the Dutch flag to space. You know, and then again, Wally, who has been thinking about going to space, well, her entire life, but certainly since the 1960s, and she was uh, part of that, of that program that got canceled, and she just kept, you know, just kept fighting until, uh, until recently we said, hey, Wally, why don't you join us for this first crew? And I can only imagine our future customers that are going to go on board, they're gonna represent the world, they're gonna represent many different backgrounds, and we certainly look forward to that. As we mentioned, we're going to have two more flights in 2021 for a total of three, and again, many more to come in the future. And that's, that is just fantastic. And I can imagine, again, as you were building the system, Gary, as you were thinking about, okay, this is not just a, just a one or two flight you know, operation with New Shepard. You've built it for, for a long-term program. We've built it to continue indefinitely and, and to take hundreds and hundreds of astronauts in the future. We hope to be into the, the thousands soon. And just think about that, right? There have only been about 560, 570 people that have ever been over the Kármán line, over up 100 kilometers up over the internationally recognized line of space. And today we're going to add four more to that list, which is so, so, so cool. Yes, and someday in the near future, we will be over 570 just on the New Shepard program. Can you imagine? Uh, are you gonna go up? Absolutely. You can go up with me? <laughs> sure. You in, man? <laughs> awesome. Okay, we are T minus four minutes and 20, min 20 seconds to go until launch. What an incredible moment. Let's check out New Shepard on the pad here. We are awaiting. Uh, the, the rocket is going to go into some last minute checks on the vehicle at T minus two minutes is when the vehicle, we throw the show over to her. It's, it's all on her, it's an autonomous vehicle. But Gary, do you wanna talk to us about what are some of those last, you know, last minute checks that the, the vehicle is going through and that we're going to see, especially on our screen? Right, so as you mentioned, the last two minutes are auto sequence and that is executed entirely by the vehicle itself um, through an automated checklist. You'll see a, a couple of things. There, there will be things that you don't see, such as sensor checks, pressure checks on the tanks, um, radio checks, all hundreds and hundreds of different checks will be stepped through in this checklist. But what you will see is the hydraulic system spooling up, uh, which will wiggle the engine gimbal as well as the aft fins. Um, those they're, they're not only wiggling those surfaces, but they're making sure that there's no stiction and they travel smoothly. Fantastic, and again, we are waiting to see that. You'll be able to see, uh, as Gary said, you don't get to see all of those uh, last minute checks, but we certainly get to see the aft fins. As Gary mentioned, those are the fins at the base of the vehicle. There are four of those. Uh, obviously, they help direct the, the rocket, both up and down. And then the, uh, the engine will gimbal. That is our BE3 engine, the Blue Engine 3. 110,000 pounds of thrust. Liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen are what uh, are, are the propellants in the engine. It's uh, not only a powerful and also throttleable engine. The throttle, I'll talk about the throttleability just here for a second. We throttle the engine back as it comes back to land. And that's what creates a nice soft landing because as it comes in, of course, it's not filled with all the propellant that it had on the way back up. So if we throttle it back kind of like an airplane, it comes in for a nice soft landing. And you know, what, what a, a trip to space and back. Again, this vehicle, uh, we've had 15 successful flights on. Again, we're looking forward to this 16th one, of course, a very special one with people on board today. I just, T minus two minutes, there we go. Bridge is retracting. The bridge is retracting. There's Oliver on the left, Jeff Bezos on the right. We are about to go to space, everybody. We are in auto sequence.
When that engine gimbal check occurs and that engine swings, they should actually be able to feel it uh, in the cabin because it'll sway the stack back and forth. There go the aft fin checks. There you see the engine gimbal check just peeking out at the base of the rocket. All right, here we go, everybody. Thousands of people contributed years to this historic moment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Blue Origin's first human flight, Godspeed, first crew of New Shepard. Let's light this candle. T minus 16, guidance internal. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, command engine start, 2, 1. Jeff, go, Mark.